This video is a recording of my reading of the biography of Muhammad as written by Joseph Campbell in his book, The Masks of God, Volume 3, Occidental Mythology. Part 1. Childhood, Youth, Marriage, and First Call, 570-610 to 610 AD. Born at Mecca to a family of the powerful Qurashi tribe, the child was bereaved of its father shortly after birth and of its mother but a few years later. Reared by relatives of little means but with numerous children, the youth, when about 24, entered the service of a, healthy wo of a wealthy woman named Khadijah, older than himself, twice married and with several children, who sent him to Syria on a commercial mission from which he returned to become her husband. She bore him two sons, both of whom died in infancy, and several daughters. In his fortieth year, Muhammad began receiving revelations, of which the first is said to have been that of Surah 96, Proclaim in the name of thy Lord and Cherisher, who created, created man from a clot of blood. Proclaim, for thy Lord is most bountiful, who has taught man to use the use of the pen, taught man what he knew not before. The accepted Muslim legend tells that this revelation came to Muhammad in a cave in the, so in the side of Mount, Mount Hira, three miles north of Mecca, to which he used to retire for peaceful contemplation, often alone, but sometimes with Khadijah. As we read in one retelling, he was there pondering the mystery of man of, of mystery of man of corruptible flesh. He was pondering the mystery of man of corruptible flesh when a dazzling vision of beauty and light overpowered his soul and senses, and he heard the word proclaim. He was confused and terrified, but the cry rang clear three times until the first overpowering confusion yielded to a recollected realization of his mission. Its author was God, its subject, man, God's creature, and its instrument, the pen, the sanctified book, which men were to read, study, recite, and treasure in their souls. His soul was filled, fil his soul was filled with divine ecstasy, but when this passed, he returned to the world of time and circumstance, which now seemed dark tenfold. His limbs were seized with a violent trembling, and he turned straight away to the one who, who shared his life, Khadijah, who understood, rejoiced, gave comfort to his shaken nerves, and knew it had been no mere illusion. She consulted her cousin, Waraka ibn Naufal, who was a worshipper of God in the faith of Christ, and when he heard, he rejoiced as well, and Khadijah returned to her husband. O chosen one, she said, may you be blessed. We do not see your do we not see your inner life true and pure? Do not all see your outer life kind and gentle, loyal to kin, hospitable to strangers? No thought of ill or malice ever has sustained your mind, no word that was not true and did not quiet the passions of narrower, narrower men has ever passed your lips. Ever ready in the service of God, you are he of whom I bear witness. There is no God but God, and you are his chosen apostle. Part 2. First Circle of Friends For three years, Muhammad and Khadijah engaged in private propaganda, first in the family and among friends, then among neighbors. Mecca, their city, was a prosperous trading station in a barren valley some fifty miles inland from the Red Sea. In its center stood a perfectly rectangular stone hut known as the Kaaba, the cube, containing an image of the patron god Hubal, as well as some other sacred objects besides the black stone, possibly of meteoric origin, that is today the central object of the entire Islamic world. This stone is now said to have been given, to Gabriel, given by Gabriel to Abraham, and its hut to have been the house that Abraham constructed with the aid of Ishmael. And in fact, even before Muhammad's time, the whole region around Mecca was regarded as a place of sanctity. An annual festival took place there with crowds, to which crowds streamed from all quarters, and many of those who came paid visits to the Kaaba. One of the literary problems of the Quran is the source of the biblical lore that abounds in it, derived largely from the Christian side, and of a distinctly Nestorian caste, for tradition holds that the Prophet was unable to read. However, certainly from childhood he must have been aware 
of many types of religion, principally, of course, the tribal and regional cults of the Arabs, but also Christianity, Judaism, and perhaps Zoroastrianism as well. Some 200 miles to the north in Medina was a large community of Jews. Directly across the Red Sea in Ethiopia was a Coptic king, Christian kingdom. His wife's cousin, Waraka, was a Christian, probably of a monophysite persuasion and the great trading routes from north to south down the Red Sea and across to India had for centuries been bearing philosophers, missionaries, and other men of learning, as well as merchants, back and forth. One need only suppose a boyhood and youth of alert interest in the oral lore and religious life round about, a little pitcher with big ears, and then a youth of high intelligent, ardent religious sensibilities, and an extraordinary capacity for extended periods of auditory trance. That's the one. An extraordinary capacity for extended periods of auditory trance. A youth of great physical strength and persuasive presence. Furthermore, as the later episodes of his biography prove, and as a rock loosened from a snowy peak, gathering snow in descent, may grow into an avalanche, so the enterprise of Muhammad and Khadijah, among their first converts were Muhammad's young cousin, Ali, who would later become his son-in-law, an older, sturdy friend, though a member of another clan, the wealthy Abu Bakr, and a faithful servant of Khadijah's house, Zaid. As the legend tells... Khadijah believed above all women in exalted above all women exalted in faith. Ali, the well beloved, then a child of but ten, yet lion hearted, plighted faith, and became from the instant the right hand of Islam. Then Abu Bakr, sincere and true hearted, a man of wealth and influence, who used both without stint for the cause, joined as sober counselor and inseparable friend. And Zaid, the freedman of Muhammad, counted freedom as naught compared with the service of God. These were the first fruits of the mission, a woman, a child, a man of wealth, and a freeman, bound in equality in Islam. Part 3. The Gathering Community in Mecca O oh, thou folded in garments, stand to prayer by night, but not all night, half, or a little less, or a little more, and in slow, measured, rhythmic tones, say forth the Koran, for soon we shall send down thee a weighty message. These imposing lines of Surah 73 are supposed to represent the second recorded revelation given to Muhammad, which is believed to have come only some time after, perhaps two years, perhaps six months, and again, as it is supposed, in the cave. The term folded in garments, Muzamil, which is one of the titles of the Prophet, is to be understood in several senses. Literally, it refers to the physical state of the Prophet in his arduous moments of trance ecstasy when, according to tradition, he would lie or sit, wrapped in a blanket, uttering divine verses while copiously perspiring. A second meaning, however, is referred to every Muslim at prayer. Like the prophet of pure heart, each is to be properly dressed for prayer, folded in a mantle, as one renouncing the vanities of this world. And finally, on the mystic plane, by the mantle we may understood the, understand the outward wrappings of a phenomenality, which are ascent of the outer wrappings of phenomenality, phenomenality, which are essential to existence but are presently to be outgrown, whereupon one's inner nature is to proclaim itself with all boldness. In the next surah, this image is continued. O thou, wrapped in a mantle, arise and deliver thy warning. Do thou magnify thy Lord. Keep thy garments free from stain and shun, shun abominations, nor expect when giving any increase to thyself, but for the Lord's cause be patient and be constant. That will be that day, a day of distress, far from easy from the, for those without faith. The old apocalyptic sense of the coming day of judgment filled the message of the prophet with the urgency of immediate event. We do not know what other prophetic movements may have been stirring in the Arab world of the time. Ecstatics of one type or another surely abounded then as now. And there were, besides, prophets of another type, known as Hanifs, who represented in various ways the influence of a general monotheistic trend driving, driving from the Zoroastrian, Jewish, and Christian centers round about. Khadijah's relative, Waraka ibn Naufal, may have been one of these. Another was the Meccid Zaid ibn Amr, who appears to have died during Muhammad's boyhood. 
In any case, there were in Mecca people enough in Muhammad's time prepared to respond to the call of a prophetic voice to constitute within a few years a typical Magian consensus, ready to make the world over in its own image. The first large group to whom Muhammad's message was addressed was the membership of his own large and influential tribe. The Quarash were the custodians of the Kaaba and the leading folk of the region. He called upon them to eliminate all pagan images from their sanctuary and to recognize their deity as the one god of Islam. An early surah, dating from this period, so adjures them. In gratitude for the covenants of divine protection and security enjoyed by the Quarash, their covenants covering journeys by winter and by summer, let them adore the lord of this house, the Kaaba, who provides them with food against hunger, hunger and security against fear. The fervor of the Prophet's increasing group provoked, in time, reactions among those of the city for whom the old deities of their tribe and the prospects of trade were life-concerned enough, and these presently became so strong that Islam could be thought of by its membership as a persecuted sect, with all the advantages to group solidarity and zeal that stemmed from such a circumstance. Muhammad, to protect his company, shipped them across the Red Sea to Aksum in Christian Abyssinia, where the king welcomed them with such sympathy that the population of Mecca began to have cause to fear that the nightmare of an earlier series of Abyssinian raids, raids and devastations might be repeated. The prophet himself, remaining in Mecca, was ab abused, reviled, and in deep trouble. And it was about this time that he was joined, providentially, by a new and wonderful convert, the young and brilliant Omar ibn a Akatab, a youth who, up to that time, had been publicly opposed to the new faith, but was now, as a kind of Paul, to become its most effective leader. However, a great and deep sorrow fell upon the already troubled prophet when his beloved wife Khadijah passed away, the great and noble, the great the noble lady, as she had been termed in appropriate praise, who had befriended him when he had been without resource, trusted him when his worth had been little known, encouraged and understood him in his spiritual struggles, and believed in him with trembling steps when he took upon the call. She withstood obloquy, persecution, insults, threats, and torments, till she was gathered to the saints in his fifty-first year. A perfect woman, she was the mother of those who believe. Then came, marvelously, the miracle, the sounding, as it were, of the muzin cry of planetary destiny, announcing the dawn of a new world age. For a summons came to Muhammad from the city of Medina, two hundred miles to the north, where strife between the two leading Arab tribes, the Aus and the Khazar, Ka, Khazraj, had brought things to such a pass that, the body of, uh, that a body of leading citizens begged Muhammad to come and exert his influence to restore peace. It was feared that the considerable Jewish community there, constituted largely of converted Arabs, might gain the ascendancy if the Arab feud went on. Muhammad, sensibly, sent his whole community ahead, and then, late in the apocal year of 622 AD, made his own secret escape, together with Abu Bakr, from Mecca to Medina, hiding for some days on the way in his cave. For, as we read in the Quran, God did indeed help him when the unbelievers drove him out, he had no more than one companion. These two were in the cave, and he said to his companion, Have no fear, for God is with us. God sent down his peace upon him and strengthened him with forces that were invisible and humbled to the depths of the word, humbled to the depths of the word of the unbelievers. But the word of God is exalted to the heights. God is exalted in might and most wise. Part 4 Muhammad in Medina, 622-632 AD. The emigration, or hijra, Arabic hijra, flight, of the Prophet to Medina marks the opening of the year from which all Muhammadian dates are reckoned, for it represents the passage of the law of Islam from the status of theory to practice and, and to manifestation in the field of history. At Medina, as Professor H. A. R. Gibb has pointed out, Muhammad set astride Mecca's vital trade route, sat aside Mecca's vital trade route to the north, and for seven years made brilliant use of this advantage to break the resistance of the oligarchy of his city. First operating as a mere brigand, he captured caravans and enriched the new community under God with booty taken from its neighbors. Next, as a brilliant ge generalismo, he met and defeated, often with angelic aid, 
asterisk, um, as Constantine and his army had seen the Shining Cross before crucial defeat of Maximum, so Muhammad and his army during the crucial battle of Badar saw angels giving them aid. The turbans of all except Gabriel were white, whereas his, according to eyewitnesses, was yellow. So, asterisk, uh, divine aid. Larger forces of his own set against him by desperate merchants of his native place. And finally, having won to his side a number of the Bedouin tribes, he returned to Mecca unopposed in the year 630, and with a grand symbolic sweep established the new order by destroying every idol in the city. One of the local goddesses, Naila, is said to have appeared at this time in the form of a black woman and to have fled away shrieking. But the black stone of the Kaaba remained, which was originally white, we are told, for it is one of the stones of paradise turned black by the kisses of sinful lips. However, at the summit of victory, the prophet two years later passed away to his eternal home, as we may suppose, where the golden Quran of his vision shines forever. And thereon it is written of God, Not merely in idle sport did we create the heavens, earth, and all between, but for just ends. However, most do not understand. Verily, the day of sorting out is the day appointed for them all, the day when no protector shall avail his client, and no help shall receive except such as receive God's mercy, for he is exalted in might the most merciful. Verily, the tree of hell, Zakum it is called, will afford the food of the sinful. Like molten brass, it will boil in their insides, like the boiling of scalding water. And a voice shall cry out, Seize him! Drag him from the midst of the blazing fire! Pour over his head the penalty of boiling water! Taste this! Mighty and full of honor you were, and indeed it was this you doubted. But as to the righteous, they shall be in a place of security, among gardens, among springs, dressed in finest silk and in rich brocade, they will meet and greet each other, and so it shall be, and we will join to them companions with beautiful, big, lustrous eyes. There they can call for every kind of fruit in security and peace, nor shall they taste death except the first death. And we shall preserve them from the blazing fire. As a boon from your Lord, that will be your supreme achievement. Moreover, we have made the Quran easy in your own tongue, that all may heed. So watch and wait, for they are waiting too. Alright, that was a biography of Muhammad with heavy quotes from the Quran written and and annotated by Joseph Campbell.